only mode. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Lithium Battery Shipping by Ground and Air. We're glad you could join us. My name's James, I run webinars and events here at Triumvirate, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief overview on what the webinar is going to entail as we run through a few housekeeping items that are listed here. Please note that everyone's microphones will be turned off for the entirety of the webinar, uh, but you can communicate any technical issues or questions you have for our speaker using the questions tab over on the right hand side of your screen. You also note that there is a question and answer period following the presentation today. You can submit questions anytime during the webinar and we'll save uh, the last 15 minutes to address those. This webinar provides an overview of the regulations and enforcement trends um, as they relate to lithium battery shipping. Um, so know that it is just an hour. Uh, we can't get to it all, but I, I think you'll find it to be an informative session. And our speaker will talk about some in-person, uh, more in-depth trainings on this topic uh, towards the end of the webinar as well. So please stick around for that. Finally, you will receive a copy of the slide deck and a recording of today's webinar, and that will arrive in your inbox tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Douglas Graham. Uh, Doug is Senior eh &S Consultant and External Training Manager here at Triumvirate Environmental. He has 23 years of eh &S training, consulting, auditing, and program development experience, and has provided over 12,000 hours of training. Doug is a nationally recognized trainer, annual guest instructor at the New England Chapter uh, CHMM Prep Course, and the developer of an award-winning, innovative online hazmat training program. He's also a contributing author for EHS Journal. So with that, I'll turn things over to you, Doug. Thanks, James. <clears throat> so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, so just to kick it off, um, lithium batteries are obviously a very hot topic in shipping today. It's one of the things that have been on uh, FAA's radar screen for quite some time, and that, uh, that pressure is uh, heating up as well. Uh, to make sure that uh, improperly prepared lithium battery shipments get you know, rejected by the operators and don't get into the system and uh, potentially create a problem. So the objective of this seminar is to give you an overview of what the regulatory requirements are both from the uh, Department of Transportation perspective as well as the International Air Transport Association, IATA, who are also involved um, in these regulations when you go to try to ship these materials. <clears throat> There's also some significant changes that kicked in April 1st, so anybody that might not be aware of those revisions, uh, those did not appear in the 2016 IATA regulations, for example, and so there's, a, there's an addendum uh, to that set of rules that is available through IATA's website, iata.org, if you want to see the full text of those. So I'll give you an overview of those uh, changes as well. So to start with, uh, why are lithium batteries <clears throat> regulated? How did this come about? Of course, they, always, they haven't always been considered a hazardous material for transport uh, purposes, but they do have certain properties that can make them uh, very dangerous, especially during uh, air shipments. So there's, there's a bunch of factors <clears throat> related to the properties of these batteries. Uh, one of them is, if you know anything about lithium batteries and why they're so popular, uh, they have certain properties that make them preferable over some of their earlier counterparts like NICAD batteries. They, are, they have a higher energy density, so you can have a smaller battery with more power. Uh, they also don't, they, they tail off in their energy very quickly when they begin to die, so you don't have that slowing down of the battery. So that's a preferable property. Um, and also, they're not temperature sensitive, so they don't lose their power with uh, different temperature swings like a lot of the other batteries do. So that's why they seem to be ubiquitous. Uh, you're finding them in all kinds of different products now, again, replacing a lot of the earlier technologies. So that high ener energy density, that's one of the issues. If there's an external short circuit, what can happen, of course, is uh, there can be a pretty dramatic arc, uh, which can lead to a fire if there were, say, a, a conductive object gets in contact with one of the conductors on the battery during transport. Uh, another big issue is the fact that defective batteries, um, something with an internal defect, could internally short circuit and also lead to a fire. Um, once there is one cell involved in a fire, 
uh, lithium batteries tend to chain react. They're wired together. They're often packed and packaged together. And so there is a chain reaction type of effect. Um, FAA, for example, has videos that show um, chain reacting pallets of lithium batteries, which is pretty uh, dramatic. And they do similar fire testing on other types of batteries with uh, very different results. So, uh, another issue, of course, is lithium, uh, especially, particularly lithium metal batteries. Uh, if they start to burn, you're dealing with a metal fire. And so traditional fire extinguishing media uh, may not be effective in just extinguishing that type of fire. Uh, that's considered a class D fire, and it's usually a specialized type of uh, fire extinguishing media that's required which is not equipped in modern aircraft. So that's more of a gas-based, halon-based system on aircraft, which may not be effective at all. <clears throat> okay, another issue is lithium metal batteries in particular um, can cause a spontaneous fire if the battery case and cell is broken open and the lithium metal is exposed to the air. So uh, lithium will react with the moisture in the air, superheat, create hydrogen, and then ignite the hydrogen all within a few seconds. Uh, not a very good uh, thing to have happen, especially during a flight. Um, also, the electrolyte, the, the liquid chemical that's in the lithium metal battery cells in particular, can be pretty nasty. Um, some of those chemicals actually, if that cell were to get damaged and leak and that liquid is exposed to the air, some of them may give off corrosive and or toxic gases, another bad property. Um, if lithium also were to begin to burn, it, it burns at a very high temperature above the, boil, uh, above the melting point of aluminum, of course, which is what the majority of the aircraft is constructed from. So those are the big issues, and this really hit the radar screen in 2006 when a UPS flight was destroyed, um, caught fire at a, at a landing attempt in Philadelphia um, in February of 06. Uh, the flight crew got out, uh, the plane was destroyed by fire. The image you see on the screen is actually um, an actual photo of the plane. You can see the top of the fuselage has a big hole in it from the fire. So this has really uh, put lithium batteries uh, on the radar screen with the FAA, National Transportation Safety Board did a big report on this incident and um, lithium batteries were considered the, uh, the primary uh, cause of this event. So shortly thereafter, they became regulated as a hazardous material. Uh, to put a finer point on that, un unfortunately, a few years later, in 2010, there was a crash involving another UPS flight. Uh, this was taking off from uh, Hong Kong and crashed uh, over Dubai in an attempted emergency landing that uh, didn't work out. So the flight crew, unfortunately, was killed in that incident. Um, they didn't conclusively state in the report that the batteries caused this event. However, there are tens of thousands of lithium batteries in the cargo hold of this flight. So it's, it's a high probability that the fire may have initiated uh, with these batteries. So this, this incident as well is uh, commonly associated with the whole lithium battery issue. Okay, enforcement. Um, Federal Aviation Administration, of course, is the part of DOT responsible for air enforcement of the hazardous materials regulations in the U.S. And this is the biggest topic um, in hazardous materials transportation today, again, because of the number of devices and how common these lithium batteries are. This is also kind of compounded by the confusing nature of the regulations, which is one of the reasons we're having this uh, webinar today. So um, civil violations for not complying with the hazardous materials regulations can be as high as $75,000. They actually just up this for inflation by a few thousand dollars just a few months ago. It's actually 77 something now. So, and the FAA is not particularly shy about imposing pretty stiff penalties on shippers that uh, either improperly prepare these shipments or operators, airlines, who uh, don't screen them out and reject improper shipments. So there's uh, certain triggers where the Federal Aviation Administration may actually pay a visit to a shipper's location, someone who's offering hazardous material. Uh, one of them is they do randomly select shipping papers, dangerous goods declarations in particular, um, uh, and also UPS uh, hazardous material shipping papers for air shipments. And they 
we'll look at the originator location and just randomly pay a visit to the shipper, uh, knock on the door unannounced and want to look at your hazardous materials program, training records, shipping paper, um, record keeping, as well as uh, the competency of the people uh, preparing the shipments and so on. So these these uh, in-house inspections do take place pretty frequently. Uh, they can be a brief visit, kind of a check-in, see, get a feel for whether the shipper knows what they're doing, uh, or they can be actually pretty exhaustive and they might be there one or two days. Uh, another trigger would be discovery in a, of an improperly prepared shipment during transport, um, or if there's an actual incident. Container breaks open, it's discovered there's lithium batteries on the inside, they haven't been declared as hazardous material when they were offered, uh, that sort of thing as well would be a big trigger. Okay, so the topics we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about how there are differences between um, air versus ground. Uh, there are several sets of regulations that you may be involved with when you're offering these, DOT versus IATA, ICAO regulations. Um, we'll also talk about how to classify batteries by both type and size. We will uh, look at the uh, where these requirements are found. I'll give you an overview of uh, what the regulations state. And we'll also talk about the April 1st revisions. And near the end, there are some regulatory requirements for uh, prototype damaged as well as waste batteries. Okay, so there's a couple poll questions that have been thrown into the webinar, and so I'm actually going to give it a minute for people to respond in real time, and then we can actually go over the results. So that this first question is related to disposal and how you are currently getting rid of your spent lithium batteries. So we'll give this just a minute. And I believe the results of this poll will be given to you, I believe, in the chat function. Yeah, so we'll give everyone a few more seconds, Doug, and we'll, we'll push them out. Uh, it should be visible on, on your screen. So it looks like almost everybody answered. We'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, let's share that. So you should see the results coming across. Doug, we've got 51% are recycling separately. 28% are recycling with other batteries, 20% uh, do not generate this type of waste, and only 1% are throwing them out in the trash. So who's right there, Doug? All right, very good. That was uh, interesting results. Uh, one, one thing about lithium battery, uh, waste lithium battery disposal is that they do ultimately have to be sorted. This may be done by a vendor or may be done on the front end uh, by the generator of the waste, but they... They are going to be have, have to be shipped separately. There's different requirements for packaging and uh, quantity limits and so on. So, um, so a mixed recycled battery waste stream uh, probably, if it's just shipped that way, it's probably not compliant. So, so that's just something to keep on your radar screen that the shipping requirements are different. And later in the presentation here, we will talk about uh, where the requirements are found for waste batteries. So thank you, James. Okay, so topic one, uh, we're going to cover the different modes of transport and how that affects batteries uh, and, how, and how they're regulated. And we'll also uh, talk about how uh, carriers can also make a difference, what uh, vendor you choose to transport these batteries. Okay, so from a regulatory perspective, um, we're in the U.S., so we're obviously under the Department of Transportation's jurisdiction when we offer any hazardous material for transport. Uh, by any mode of transport, so whether it's rail, whether it's highway, air, or vessel, uh, we're always under their authority. Um, however, if we ship hazardous material internationally by air, there is a, an international standard that comes from the uh, from ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization. So they're part of the UN. They have a subcommittee on hazardous materials, dangerous goods, and uh, they make recommendations. Now. Those aren't regulations, that's a standard. So individual countries uh, can adopt that as a regulation. And in the U.S., the DOT has adopted ICAO regulations for international air transport. So they actually reference that set of rules um, in the CFR, in the, in the 49 CFR. 
However, when we offer hazardous materials for shipments with an airline who's a member or by policy follows the IATA regulations, International Air Transport Association, which is actually a trade association, um, that forces the shippers, those who offer hazardous material, to that, those airlines to follow the IATA regulations. So the IATA regulations actually comply with ICAO, so that makes the DOT happy. So in a roundabout kind of way, that's how we ended up in the IATA regulations. Now those are used for international air transport of hazardous material. However, the airlines, um, most of them will actually adopt that set of rules for domestic transport as well. Okay, so that's true with FedEx Express. So when we choose that service, uh, ship with FedEx Express, they always follow the IATA regulations regardless of where it's gone, domestically or internationally. Um, and that's true with all the other commercial um, passenger airlines. There's one wild card in all this, and that's UPS. Uh, for domestic air transport, UPS does follow the DOT regulations. Uh, but they also have a lot of their own variations that are layered on top of that, and those are found in the UPS Hazmat Shipping Guide, which is on their website. Okay, and uh, there's a little note there on the slide. Uh, they also have a fact sheet on shipping lithium batteries that they revised this year, so that's worth also taking a peek at uh, if you use UPS. If you use UPS... Um, for ground, or you ship FedEx ground, all ground shipments will follow the 49 CFR regulations. So that's whether you're using an LTL carrier, FedEx ground service, UPS ground, or anybody else. Okay, so that's straight 49 CFR. However, you obviously always want to check with the carrier to see if they have any additional restrictions, which many of them do. Okay, there we go. There's a um, revelation. Determining the carrier and the mode of transport does make a difference. Okay, so really the first step is, who are we going to use? Are we going to use UPS? Are we going to use FedEx? Um, do we ship ground? Do we ship air? I highly recommend that if you have the opportunity to keep the batteries on the ground and ship only by highway, I would take that opportunity just because your liability goes way down um, when you keep these things on the, on the ground. Uh, the enforcement triggers really aren't there the way they are for air shipments uh, either. And of course, are we going to ship overseas or is this, is, this, is this a domestic shipment? Okay, so the second step is one, once we've decided on our, our carrier, our mode of transport, we take a look at our battery or our device um, that uh, contains the battery. So the first thing we have to determine is what type of battery it is. So before we go there, this is our second and final poll question. So we'll just give this a few minutes for everybody to chime in. How many devices do you have at your facility that use lithium batteries? So think about things like medical equipment, laptops, uh, personal uh, entertainment type devices, electronic devices, uh, test equipment, spare batteries, so let's just give it a minute for everybody to chime in on this one. All right, we'll go ahead and push those results out, Doug. Um, and as we can see, we've got 62% have more than 50 of those devices. Uh, and our next highest is less than 10 at 15%, and it goes down from there. Well, it's almost an all or nothing. So that's interesting results. Uh, so many people having more than 50 devices is interesting because, of course, if you have these things, people might want to ship them, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges is trying to determine if, uh, if any employees are trying to offer any devices or individual batteries for shipment and uh, haven't been trained properly to do it. So that's something that should be on your radar screen. Thanks, James. Okay, so again, the first... Uh, the second thing we have to figure out after we determine the carrier and the mode of shipment is what type of lithium battery are we dealing with. So there are two primary types. There's a lithium ion battery, uh, and that would also include lithium polymer batteries. And then there's lithium metal batteries, uh, which sometimes uh, would also include lithium alloy batteries. Okay, so these are the two regulatory terms for these. 
and we'll talk first about lithium metal batteries. Now, one easy way to determine which it is is um, lithium metal batteries are not rechargeable. So these are known as primary batteries. Uh, button batteries are an example you see on the slide. <coughs> um, and so these, these are common, obviously, in things like calculators, cameras. Um, data loggers might have a small lithium battery, medical devices. Now, there's some large ones in things like remote monitoring equipment for oil wells, and there's all kinds of applications, industrial as well as uh, consumer. Uh, they, they are generally marked lithium and, uh, on occasion, uh, lithium alloy. Okay, a lithium ion battery is rechargeable. It's known as a secondary battery. And they are almost always marked lithium ion. And again, it includes lithium polymer batteries. And uh, that should also be marked right on the outside. And I'm sure we're all familiar with these in our laptops and cell phones and so on. And these can also be quite large, like in uh, uh, hybrid cars and electric cars and so on. OK, our next step is to classify our lithium batteries. So in the hazardous and materials and dangerous goods regulations, there are nine hazard classes. And they would include explosives, gases, flammable liquids, flammable solids, some reactive materials like dangerous and wet. Um, they also include oxidizers, poisons, biohazards, uh, radioactives, and corrosives. And then there's a catch-all class 9 category where there's some oddball things that don't fall into those first eight categories, and that's known as miscellaneous or class 9. And that's where the lithium batteries fall in because they do have unique uh, properties and risks. Okay, so lithium batteries are listed in the hazardous materials table on the right of the DOT regulations, as well as the IATA list of dangerous goods, which we see there on the left. Uh, now, these regulations are a little better aligned than they were a few years ago, so both the DOT and IATA recognize the same six possible shipping names. And again, alphabetically listed, they, you find them in the L's. Okay, so these are the six shipping names, three for lithium ion batteries, three for lithium metal batteries. And you can see the variations uh, among the two types, different shipping names for if you're going to ship the battery alone versus contained in the equipment, like a laptop that has the battery installed, as opposed to packing the battery and the device in the same packaging, but the, the battery is not installed. Okay, so that's how you get the three variations in the shipping names. Okay, so that's, that's our first step. And then we size the battery. Okay, now this is important because the regulations will vary quite a bit for a small or medium or large battery. So the larger the battery is, the more regulated it becomes and the more requirements there are. So there's some nice uh, variations in the regulations for smaller batteries that makes your life a little bit easier. Okay, so now how we size a lithium-ion battery, we'll start there. We look at the watt-hour rating. Now, the watt-hour rating is supposed to be marked right on the outside of the battery. It's a requirement for the manufacturers, and that started in uh, just a few years ago. Okay, so we can see the WH, 49 watt-hours. Okay, so that's an important number. Okay, we also have to know how many how many watt hours per cell. So if it's a multi-cell battery, like it's a battery pack with individual cells on the inside, um, we have to calculate the watts per uh, watt hours per cell as well. And the reason why it's important is because there's going to be some different requirements once you get over 100 watt hour per battery and over 20 watt hours per cell. If you stay under that, the requirements are uh, less stringent. Okay. Um, an older battery, more than a few years old, uh, the watt hour rating didn't have to be on there, but the volts and uh, amp hours were. Okay, so formula, we just multiply the volts times the amp hours, and that gives us the watt hour rating. Okay. Okay, and again, a good rule of, rule of thumb here, 
laptop batteries are usually either 49 watt hours or 58 watt hours, and they contain between three and six cells on the inside of the battery pack. So they're going to be falling into that small category. Okay, with lithium metal batteries, it's a little bit different. They look at the uh, total number of grams of lithium per cell, and unfortunately, that's not marked on the battery, usually just the voltage. So you may have to get in touch with the manufacturer of the battery to determine this. Um, a good rule of thumb here is that a AA battery uh, typically has just shy of one gram of lithium. So just give you a kind of perspective on how much that is. Okay, so now we'll move into uh, requirements that are applicable to all lithium batteries, regardless of mode of transport and regardless of size and regardless of type. Okay, and then we'll start breaking it down a little bit more. Okay, so this, I'm sure, has probably been on everybody's radar screen in the news. You see a burnt up hoverboard there. You can even see the little burnt up cells where the battery pack used to be that's now all melted away and charred all up. So one of the biggest risks here is that you you're offering a poorly manufactured battery that has defects that could catch fire during transport. Okay, so this is why you had a ban on hoverboards being transported by air and all kinds of uh, craziness around this. And this is certainly not the only type of device that's had issues uh, regarding poor quality batteries. Okay, so how do the regulators deal with that? What they do is they require the shipper, the offerer, to ensure that you're offering a battery that has been tested properly by the manufacturer. So you can see the reference on this slide for the UN Manual of Tests and Criteria uh, with the part and subsection number. These are known as the T-tests, and this is what the manufacturer is supposed to do to test all these batteries to make sure they're, uh, they're not defective. So this includes things like um, overcharging them and uh, uh, reversing the current and doing things to uh, make sure they don't catch fire when uh, these crazy things happen. Okay, so getting documentation from the supplier that they've been tested in accordance with this UN manual is, uh, is very important. Okay, they also have some specific manufacturing uh, uh, devices that have to be included during the manufacturing of the battery, such as a venting device. Okay, there also has to be an external short, uh, a, per, a means of preventing external short circuiting. Okay, and then batteries connected um, in parallel have to have a reverse current flow uh, device, that, the device that prevents that. And something new they added to the regulations just a few years ago is a quality management program. And you can see the regulatory reference for the specifics on that. So that's another thing you would want to get from the manufacturer is something in writing that they uh, comply with this, this quality management program requirement. Okay, so to put this together, uh, we're going to talk about what the requirements are in the regulations for the different battery types, the different sizes, and the modes of transport. Now this is actually where the webinar differs from actual training. So if this were a training course, it would be a lot longer. And we would go through and look up these actual requirements and sort of, you know, to teach you how to develop SOPs for each battery type. That takes a long time um, and because there's so many different variables. Uh, but these slides will show you where to go in the regulations to find the requirements to develop these SOPs. Okay, so for ground shipping, we'll start there. You go to the DOT hazardous materials regulations and you can, you can, um, you should be accessing those online, not looking at one of the 49 CFR books, which are typically out of date by the time they go to press. Okay, you can, so you can access that through the eCFR website, electronic CFR website, or go through the DOT's website, phmsa, P-H-M-S-A dot D-O-T dot gov. Okay, and specifically where you want to go is 49 CFR parts 100-185, and you'll see that if it's a small, Smaller battery, those are going to be regulated under paragraph C of 173.185, that's part 173, section 185. If it's a fully regulated battery, and again, this is delineated by size, uh, they're going to be subject to the totality of the regulations. So you really have to go soup to nuts, go through every subpart, 
and uh, just as if you were shipping any other hazardous material. So again, the magic numbers there for lithium ion and lithium metal batteries in terms of size, sizing is given to you on the bottom of the slide there. For air transport, you're either going to be in the uh, DOT regulations or you're going to be in the IATA regulations. And you'll be in the DOT regulations if you're using UPS domestic air. Every other scenario, you're in the IATA regulations. Okay, so once again, they you have different requirements for fully regulated batteries. Those are known in the IATA regulations as Section 1 batteries within the packing instruction. And Section 2 batteries, and that's within the packing instruction you're referenced to, are known as Section 2 batteries. Okay, another wild card in all this, of course, is that the individual operators may have variations, including approval. So you can see a couple items here on this slide. Um, as of July 1st, 2015, UPS requires pre-approval for shippers that are offering uh, lithium metal batteries, and that's just the batteries themselves, not packed or contained in equipment. But if you're going to ship individual lithium metal batteries, with UPS, you've got to get in touch with them and get uh, go through the approval process. FedEx also has a similar situation um, with lithium metal batteries, and that's been around a little longer. And uh, again, this uh, if you go on FedEx's website, there's some fact sheets on lithium batteries, and um, you'll see the 800 number for how to get the uh, go through the approval process. Okay, so let. Like I said, if this was a, a training course where we're digging down into the regulations uh, to that level of detail, it would be um, an additional three and a half hours beyond these webinar slides, and uh, there'd be 140 more slides. So just to give you an idea of what kind of detail and uh, variations there are in the rules, it does take quite a bit to drill down in them. <clears throat> but that's what you'd have to do to actually develop the um, SOP on how to ship a particular battery. Okay, uh, April 1st revisions. It's always good to know um, what's out there in terms of uh, new rules. There was a couple of significant changes uh, to the air regulations that came from uh, ICAO and were adopted uh, by IATA effective April 1st. Okay, the first one is a new restriction on transporting lithium ion batteries on passenger aircraft. So in the US, lithium metal batteries were already restricted from passenger air. Uh, but again, this is, this is something completely new where they're taking all lithium batteries, so now including the lithium ion batteries, and saying no shipment by passenger air. And that's actually regardless of how big the battery is. Okay? So, they uh, obviously because these can be a threat during flights. They want to kind of take them off, take them out of the passenger air world. Now, if they're contained in a device or packed, uh, packed with the equipment, or it's actually contained in the device, this, there is not a prohibition on passenger air, and that's for either lithium metal or lithium ion. Okay, another uh, rule change is uh, you might here this referred to as the SOC rule or the state of charge rule. So if you're offering a lithium battery uh, for transport effective April 1st, you have to drain it. It can't, and it cannot be above 30% of its uh, uh, charge. Okay, so this, again, this is not a battery that's installed in a device or packed with the uh, equipment, but it's uh, just shipping the battery itself or batteries. And there's a little note on how to, uh, the methods for determining the state of charge that are, you see on the slide. Okay, also the cargo aircraft only label is now required uh, when offering uh, lithium batteries uh, that have the, sh the uh, ID number UN3480, Section 2. So these are the uh, restricted from cargo air. Okay, so these are the lithium-ion batteries shipped alone that are now prohibited from passenger air because they're prohibited from passenger It has to have no aircraft only label on it. Uh, note, by the way, that cargo air only label 
is new. It's uh, that's been redesigned a couple of years ago. So if you have any in stock that say danger at the top rather than cargo aircraft only, uh, get rid of those because mine is now sorry, to say cargo aircraft only on the passenger air label consistent with you. But uh, again, don't use the old ones that say danger on the top any longer. Okay, another prohibition that kicked in on April 1st is uh, not offering more than one package of um, UN3480 uh, lithium ion batteries and also making sure that it's separated from other uh, packages in the consignment. Okay, so this is basically one package at a time uh, for uh, lithium ion batteries that have been that are packed alone, not contained in equipment or packed with equipment. Okay, and and one of the last the last topic here is what do we do with waste lithium batteries? What ha what happens if we have active or damaged battery? And what if we're in the business of battery manufacturing or we're doing, we're a testing lab or we're a um, R and D facility and we've got prototype batteries? Okay, so the first issue is you're not going to be shipping these by air. Okay, so you're in the DOT requirements for ground uh, waste lithium battery is actually pretty easy to uh, prepare for shipment. Okay, so there's no testing requirements, there's no record keeping requirements, and they don't have to be in UN spec hazardous materials packaging. If they're in a strong outer container, Okay, they're specifically exempted from the shipping paper requirements, the markings, the hazard labels, the handling labels, placarding of vehicles, emergency response information from the training requirements and the UN specification packaging requirements. However, you do have to follow the specific provisions that are in 173, 185, paragraph C1 through 3. So that's going to explain how to package and prepare these, and as long as you stay within those paragraphs and follow those provisions, then you don't have to go anywhere else in the regulations to figure out how to ship them. Okay, prototype batteries, and there's a definition for those. Um, those are prohibited from air shipment uh, unless they, you get approv approval from the DOT. So that would have to be in the way of a special permit or a DOT authorization. Okay, and the specific requirements for how to ship a prototype lithium battery is found in uh, Part 173, Section 185, Paragraph E. Okay, not that this would have ever happened, but uh, a damaged or defective battery. Okay, so if you do have something that's uh, being returned for, for safety reasons, or it's, uh, it's swollen and overheated, or something damaged, or it's broken open, or whatever the problem is, um, no shipments by air. So those are prohibited from air shipments. <clears throat> and the specific uh, requirements, if you look at the bottom of the slide, uh, found in paragraph F of 173-185. Okay, and there's a little breakdown on the next slide as to uh, that gives you an overview of what those requirements are. Okay, so that that wraps up the content. Um, I will mention that for those of you who are local, uh, New England, we, we actually are offering a full-blown training on how to prepare uh, lithium batteries for shipment. That's a four-hour class, and that's being held in uh, here in Woburn on October 20th for anybody that uh, is interested in going whole hog on, you know, how to develop an SOP for shipping these specific batteries. And we're probably also offering it again uh, later in the year, and it might be, uh, you know, we might roll it out into other geographic areas as well. Uh, so stay tuned, and you can access information about that on our website. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and I actually just included a link in the chat box, so everybody should uh, receive a notification there on the right if you'd like to visit our list of upcoming uh, in-person trainings.
um, that Doug also leads. And if you scroll through the list, you'll find the one on uh, lithium battery shipping training, and that's the one in October that Doug was talking about. So as we go through the questions here, we've got uh, a little more than 15 minutes left. Feel free to, to peruse our trainings that are coming up, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Before we get to those, I just want to reiterate that you will receive the materials today uh, in an email tomorrow. I know we, we get a lot of questions about that. Um, that will include the slide deck as well as the recording. You'll also get a link to the survey, um, so please let us know what you thought. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback on the webinar and any ideas you have for improvement. Uh, and finally, in addition to offering open enrollment training, Triumvirate, if you're not uh, too familiar with us, also provides hazardous waste disposal consulting and other EHNS services. Uh, so feel free to give us a call. We have our phone number there on the right, our website, and Doug Graham's email address in case you have more questions for him following today's event. So uh, let's get to those questions. Doug, we've got a handful. Uh, let's start with um, this one. What are the requirements for passengers traveling with lithium batteries or devices that contain lithium batteries? Uh, that's a great question uh, because this uh, webinar didn't include uh, that issue because uh, the focus was on shipping the batteries as cargo. Uh, but if you're traveling and you've got, uh, let's say, a personal electronic device that has lithium battery, uh, right where those requirements are found, and of course TSA should be screening these things that, that are not allowed, and uh, they may even have information at the airports posted about what you can and cannot bring on the plane. But if you want to find out the requirements and what TSA is supposed to be enforcing, uh, if you look at the IATA regulations, uh, it's section 2.3 of the dangerous goods regulations. It's called dangerous goods carried by passengers or crew. And it actually breaks down uh, a bunch of devices that contain lithium batteries or spare batteries. And just as an example, the things they mention are uh, spare batteries being carried by passengers. Also, they discuss um, portable electronic devices containing lithium metal or lithium ion cells or batteries. They also mention lithium battery powered electronic devices. A new one that was added this year, e-cigarettes, which are uh, powered by little lithium batteries. They also mention portable electronic devices. So they actually, they actually, if you look at this, they break it down into, is the approval of the operator required? Is it permitted in as checked baggage? Is it permitted as in your carry-on? And is it permitted to be on your person? So there are various uh, prohibitions on number of batteries, size, whether you can go put in your suitcase or not. So that's where you'd want to go. Again, section 2.3. Uh, of the IATA regulations, dangerous goods carried by passengers or crew. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, we had a question come in early on in the presentation, right after our first poll. This came from Gary. His comment was, several companies offer mixed recycling solutions. We use the big green box. Is this not compliant? Uh, I would have to know quite a bit more about the big green box, to be, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, again, they may be sorting after the, all the batteries are commingled. It's hard to say. How, I, I'm not familiar with that particular program. So, but that's something you could ask your vendor. And if you know the requirements, but again, going to that slide on waste batteries, going to that section, see what the requirements are, that will give you the basis to then ask your vendor, uh, is this what you guys are for? But, uh, again, I'm not personally familiar with that um, company or that service, so it's hard for me to say. Thanks, and um, no worries. We can look at that further, like you said, uh, maybe a question for, for that specific vendor. Um, Jessica asks, how is consignment defined? And she gives the example, two packages to the same person or two packages offered at the same time during the same pickup by UPS. How would you define consignment? Uh, I, I think Jessica was referring to the... Uh, the slide uh, that says limiting and separating um, lithium-ion battery consignments. So if we look at that slide, 
Uh, a shipper is not permitted to offer for transport more than one package of uh, lithium ion batteries packed alone in any single consignment. Now, a consignment is uh, sort of when the you know, the UPS's driver is standing there and you give them a bunch of stuff, that's the consignment. So at any one time, you're not supposed to offer more than one package. That's the way, you know, that's my understanding of consignment. Yeah, it sounds like that addresses our question. If not, Jessica, let us know and we can follow up. Um, thanks, Doug. So here's a question from Rudy. You mentioned that batteries should be drained if possible before shipping. How is that accomplished? Um, there's presumably various methods from installing the battery in the device and running it down. Uh, there may be also uh, charging stations that will give you this, the, the percentage of charge. The, um, again, if you look on that slide, there is a methodology to that that's referenced in the uh, UN uh, Manual of Tests and Criteria. So that's where I'll, where I point you. Uh, I haven't personally taken batteries and drained them to determine the state of charge myself, but that's uh, where I would start. Is I would look at those requirements, and then um, again uh, investigate what kind of uh, method from there, uh, short of just uh, using the device that the battery goes into until it runs dead. Certainly, it's 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 thirty percent or lower, so it, it could be completely drained, obviously. Got it. Thanks for clarifying, Doug. And at this time, we'll take a few more questions. Um, I know I've got about three or four in the queue. Um, so if you have one you want to get out there, now's the time to do it. Or again, take down Doug's email address and, uh, and you can follow up after the webinar. Um, Thomas asks, if a waste lithium battery exceeds one gram per cell or two grams per battery, what regulations apply? Uh, regardless of the size of the battery, you're still in the same section. Uh, that's referenced on that slide. So, uh, you know, these are ground shipments, so it's a little bit different. You don't have a, a lot of different requirements depending on the size when you're dealing with waste batteries being shipped by highway. So I would refer you um, to that section, and you're not going to have those kind of um, uh, differences that you do for uh, air shipping uh, virgin batteries. So. You know, you can ship waste batteries of all kinds of different sizes. Once you go over 35 kilograms, you may have to uh, get involved in the approval process. But uh, yeah, under 35 kilograms, uh, they're probably all going to be uh, dealt with the same way. Okay, very good. Um, let's do. Let's take this question from Corey. Are Temptails uh, lithium battery in equipment regulated? Are they allowed to be attached to the outside of a package for shipment? Yeah, they are. They're actually addressed in the IATA regulations. So you would um, you would look up the shipping name. You'd go through all these steps. But that would be a lithium metal battery, non-rechargeable. And when you get to the packing instruction, there is a specific clause in there that uh, that addresses the temperature loggers. So they're they're recognized as hazardous material, but uh, they um, you shouldn't have to do anything special in terms of um, shipping those things. So, but I, I would refer you to um, again the packing instruction and the IATA regulations that address the temperature loggers. Great, and uh, let's take. We got two more here, Doug. Uh, Raymond has a follow-up to the consignment question. I thought maybe consignment was that you could not offer for shipment uh, to one vendor three boxes on one air bill. I thought you would have to offer three individual shipments to the same vendor. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to follow up with, with that one to see how consignment is, is being defined by the vendors. Right. Um, so that might be a good question, actually, for UPS or FedEx, um, whether individual air bills would be considered individual uh, consignments. I, I don't think so, but again, that's a subtlety that we might have to work with the vendor to figure out how they're defining that. Sure. Great. Uh, also, uh, I'll mention that some of the subtlety and interpretive questions that people might have, the best source for answering those questions is the, actually the DOT Hazardous Materials Hotline. So if everybody wants to make note of this number, maybe you can include it in the chat, um, follow-up stuff, uh, James. 
is 1-800-467-4922. So again, that's the DOT Hazardous Materials Hotline in Washington, and that's all they do all day long is uh, interpretive questions about the hazmat regulations. So some of these I might call them to answer your question. Excellent. All right, we just sent that number through, so everybody should have that. All right, Doug, to finish, um, let's talk a little bit more about training. We have a question here. Does Triumvirate offer on-site trainings for clients in addition to those health hotel trainings that we, we talked about? Yeah, we do. Um, and actually, the majority of training that we do is probably done for employees of uh, clients uh, at their own locations. So anything that we offer on our website, we could certainly do uh, in-house for you as well. And there's other trainings that we don't do it open enrollment events that we can also do on site. Great. Thank you. And if you are interested in, in a training with Doug, uh, reach out to us and, uh, and we'll see if we can, we can get that coordinated. Um, great. I, I want to thank everyone for their time today. We'll, we'll give you back uh, seven or eight minutes here. And we really appreciate your attention, some, some really good questions, and we hope you learned something new today uh, and have taken away some valuable information. Uh, Doug, we appreciate you presenting. Do you have anything else to add before we close down? Uh, just thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Uh, well, that concludes our webinar. Please expect that email tomorrow with some additional information and the short survey. Thanks for your time, and have a great rest of the day. Take care.